I have a, had a friend who's gone to be with the Lord, and his name was Tom Cunningham, Lauren Cunningham, the founder of uh, Youth of the Mission. His father was a preacher. And in fact, I think oh, there were a whole line of preachers in back of Lauren. And his mom was a preacher, Aunt Jewel. And uh, Tom would never use a mic. Didn't matter how big the audience was, he'd just put it down and say, if I needed one of those, I could have, you know, gone into another kind of business or whatever, you know, and it was so this small of a group, but for the recording of it, it's very helpful. <laughs> and you, it, do you know you preach differently with a mic than if you don't have a mic? Because if you don't have a mic, then you're really working on your this, and so some of the little whispers get lost. Um, let's pray again. Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to minister and to be a part of what you have done here in Sun Prairie by establishing a church, uh, a body of believers that love you and serve you and are learning to love you and serve you better in your name. Amen. So I'm going to retitle the message that I thought of. This is, uh, I'm going to, and I've, um, I have some people, I was really excited that you guys put this up on YouTube because I brought my phone and was going to set this up to videotape it. But there's a, a group of us that are working diligently to to teach uh, how to teach. Um, God, years and years ago, um, I was in Virginia, and we had moved to Virginia uh, to start a school of evangelism in Richmond, Virginia. And we had been in Texas, I had been training, I had just finished studying at the School of the Bible, and uh, we were still recovering, I think, very much so from the loss of a child, and we picked up our whole family and shoved it into a, into a box truck and drove everything, including one of my pottery kilns, all the way to Virginia. I unloaded the kiln, never used it while I was in Virginia. And, uh, and while we were there, as we got then, after three years, um, the school of evangelism crashed when I got there, and there was no school. They had moved it to Washington, D.C., and so we had moved our whole family to all the way across, halfway across the country to Virginia, and now I didn't have a job. I suppose that's never happened to anybody, right? You got all these great plans, and you're going to be a school leader in YWAM, which is the big deal. You can be a base leader, but if school leaders are the ones that are training the kids, and they're really, they're, they're training the new guy, kids. That are, it's real hands-on, and I, I, um, I like hands-on. You know, I make pottery, right? That's very <laughs> hands-on. And um, when we were, we had, and so they came to us, and they said, well, you know, the school evangelism is gone, but um, what, we really need help taking care of the children at the YWAM base because people, you know, we've got a bunch of young children and so would you guys consider starting a school? And so this is, we went, well, you know, don't have anything else to do and I was playing. We had, before we had left Texas, uh, one day I went, oh, I'm going to have my kids with me when we go to Virginia and we've got this great school called Christian Heritage School in Tyler, Texas where we've been working and teaching. I hadn't been teaching. I had been studying at the School of the Bible that was in town there. And uh, we, uh, I asked God, I said, what am I going to do about the kids' education, God? And God said to me, John, you can teach them. I went, oh, okay. You know, like, all right, just, you know, blindly stumbling ahead just because God said to do something, Right. And uh, so I didn't worry about it. So we got, so when they asked us, would you start the school? I thought, okay. So they had some adult, not older kids, like 
elementary school. They had some preschool kids. And so Suzanne started a preschool and a kindergarten. And she had two helpers, Elizabeth and Gail Eccles. And Gail Eccles, we just saw in uh, Washington, D.C. last week when we were out visiting my son for new, and his family for New Year's. <laughs> she hasn't changed a bit. And uh, it's just amazing. And so we, uh, we did that. Suzanne got that going, and she had a really great program. And I let all the other parents that had elementary school and junior high, I don't think they had any high school kids there that I would be setting up. And they had these beautiful classrooms. They were great big slate blackboards. The school, Rock Castle, had been a school for uh, Native American kids. Let me turn this off somehow. Here, turn this off. I don't need it. I got a Bible, so I don't need this. And uh, <laughs> it was from a friend who was with us in Kabul, Afghanistan, that just broke one of my mugs that he's had for 30 years. Wanted to know if I could fix it. So, no, I'm going to send him a new one. And so, he, um, so we were uh, starting this school, and I had these, I had two kids at the time that were elementary age. It was Christian and Sarah. And the beautiful classrooms had been a school for African-American and Indian kids that had been started by the Catholics and it had this gorgeous classroom, huge, like a classroom was as big as this room and with beautiful slate blackboards that were really wonderful to write on. If, never, if you've never written on a slate back, black, blackboard as a teacher, they never should have changed things because it was so much nicer. And uh, I like to write as I teach. I don't use overheads very often. Uh, I like the immediateness of it, and I can change things and add to things and ask questions, and I, I do that a lot. And when we all came down push and shove, nobody wanted to put their kids in my little classroom. Not one of the other YWAM parents trusted me to teach their kids. I mean, I can understand why I didn't have a I don't have a college degree. I, don't ha I had a Bible degree, a two-year Bible degree, but no college, no four-year degree, no teaching certificate, no one, so on and so forth. And so I spent the next three years teaching <laughs> two kids, Christian and Sarah. And that was what I did for three years at Rock Castle. I ran another staff and leadership training program, but that was sort of a minor thing. And so it was, it was really interesting. God took me. I sort of felt like Paul when, he sent him, when God sent him to the desert. And, okay, I want you to learn some things out here. And I didn't preach anywhere. I didn't, you know, I was just like a hiatus. And God dealt with me in a lot of ways about um, making something out of myself. Because here I had this job to teach my kids. And in Deuteronomy 6, it says that's one of the things that we're supposed to do, uh, teach our kids. We're supposed to take God's word and teach them. And here and there and everywhere we go, we're supposed to teach about God's law and God's word and God's works. And so I began to learn about what that meant. And I spent a lot of time. I had to teach English grammar. Now, you have to understand, I never learned English grammar. I went to school in California. <laughs> you know. I mean, and that's, that's how Craig and I got together. I think we met in the gym, and we found out that we were both from California, and we liked to surf. That's the foundation of our relationship, surfing. <laughs> so, you know. Surfing for Jesus. Why don't we have schools now, discipleship training schools, that's with an emphasis on surfing? Not really sure that they're getting what they need. But anyway, <laughs> we, um, I used to spend early in the morning, I'd get up and I'd be, I remember once I was teaching. <laughs> you guys don't, probably don't even know what I'm talking about. I had just finished a two-year course of Greek. I knew Greek grammar. 
And Greek grammar is a lot more complicated than English grammar. And so in, and this is funny because today it's all about pronouns, right? So in English, you have he, him, his, right? First person, singular. Th third person, singular. Uh, he, him, his. And, uh, but in Greek, there's eight different forms of that pronoun. Every pronoun. In fact, there's 24 different ways to say I in Greek. I know. So English is really simple. And I didn't know it. And I used to spend my mornings before school on my knees praying and asking God what, what, how, what the, the answers were to this book I was using to teach English grammar because there weren't any answers in the book because obviously if you're a teacher, you know the answers. Why would they put the an answers in the book? It was about 150 years old, this book I was using. It's called Harvey's English Grammar. If you're a homeschooler, you probably know what I'm talking about. And uh, God did so much in our lives as we did that. And as we were leaving there to go back to Texas, I said, so what now? What am I going to do? I remember sitting in my classroom by myself, packing things up, really sort of depressed because we felt like God was taking us back to work with the Teachers for the Nations program and help Barbara and Jim Kilkenny, who were leading the teacher training program in Texas. And we felt like we were supposed to go back and help them. And I had already been to Africa in 1983 and taught with my potter's wheel. But I'd never, you know, and now I've spent three years learning how to teach English and math and history and all of this stuff. And there was, um, I really developed as a person, as a teacher during this time. And uh, Christian and I studied uh, deer anatomy after we shot them and gutted them and cleaned them, you know. So now he's a doctor, right? So that's how, that was his beginning in gross anatomy. <laughs> and uh, I was sitting there, and God spoke to me. Now, he doesn't do this all the time, okay? Don't get the idea that I ask God a question and he answers me. It's rare every now and then. I feel him lead me and direct me all the time, at different times. I, I notice things happen. I think, oh, that must have been God, a divine appointment or whatever, like meeting Craig. There we go. That's a divine appointment, see? But God didn't say, go to Princeton Club and there you will meet Craig. You know, it wasn't like that. But God spoke to me that morning, and he said, John. I said, what am I going to do now? And he said to me, John, I have called you to teach. That was it. But I was that, I go, oh, okay. Now I know what my calling is. A lot of people struggle their whole life with what their calling is. Just ask God, He knows. And He will show you. And as I've been teaching, I've been working with this group called the Foundation for American Christian Education. In fact, in Africa, we started the Foundation for African Christian Education in Namibia, incorporated as a nonprofit there. And I met these two ladies called Miss Hall and Miss Slater, who wrote these books that they've used to teach the history. One of the books is uh, called um, Chalk. Christian History of the Constitution of the United States of America. That's the title of the book. Christian History of the United States of the United Christian History of the United States of America. And the other one was called Teaching and Learning America's Christian History. Those two foundational books. And we've added other books since then. And um, we, I, uh, I think, I, did I print the thing? A definition of history here on your notes. Da, da, da. Let's get to the notes. I hardly ever use notes, but I thought I would for your sakes this morning. Uh, this is in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. So I'm really excited about, uh, I was asked when we got back to the States if we would, if I would start teaching more 
for doing stuff online for other people that are studying this particular approach. And so Webster's 1828 Dictionary was actually written by Noah Webster, the father of American Christian education, okay, in 1828. That's why it's called Webster 1828. And his defini definition of history is an account of facts, particularly facts respecting nations or states, a, nation, a narration of events in the order in which they happened with their causes and effects. And um, I think a lot, of, a lot of people today think that everything is sort of random. There aren't any real causes and effects behind things. And uh, teaching history, let me read this quote from um, Reverend Foljam that he wrote in 1876. Um, people used to have a real understanding that God, that history was his story. We have moved away from that. In fact, today, if you say B.C., you don't say B.C., you say B.C.E. And it doesn't mean before Christ, before Christ it means it says before the common era. That's how they teach us to understand history today. So, and it's not A.D., which means in the year of our Lord in Latin, but it's something else. I forget what they call it. I think it's stupid. Because if the whole history of, the way we count and measure history goes to the birth of Christ, right? Hello. You know, so the secularists have tried to take that away from us. They can't because we're not going to start over with a new calendar. Maybe we will someday. And, uh, so, this quote by Foljam, when we taught it in Africa, they, they call him Foljambe, which I thought was really funny. And uh, so they Africanized it. And uh, this says this, the more thoroughly a nation deals with this history, okay, we want our nation to be a Christian nation. How many of you want to see America turn around for Jesus? And in some way or another, we could call America a Christian nation. Well, let me, let me explain something to you right now. America is a Christian nation because our foundation and our documents are Christian by, in nature. But I won't go into that right now. But this is something that Fulgham is talking about, how we study history. It says, the more thoroughly we study history... A nation deals with this history. The more decidedly it will recognize and own an overruling providence therein. And the more religious a nation or Christian a nation will it become. So there's a whole bunch of causes and effects in this. There's a bunch of if-then statements in this passage. So people say, well, we want to see America really gung-ho for Jesus, you know, and really recognize. And so we're going to teach all sorts of things about the Bible and so on and so forth. But what Fulgham is saying here, it's our history, our own history, that will help us and will help the nation become a Christian nation. And the rest of the statement says this, well, the more superficially it deals with this history, seeing only second, that secondary causes and human agency, the more irreligious will it be. So we got two contrasts. I use, when I teach this, I usually, use, with a blackboard, which is helpful, I use a T-chart. I got a so I contrast two ideas. And when we contrast things, when you teach using a contrast, like in this case, thoroughly and superficially, you're, you're going to show which is superior. Okay? Everything is not equal. That we don't just compare, you know, sugar and honey, you know. It's, we're, we're contrasting things. So what I'm, when I'm teaching, 
you today about history and about knowing God, it's going to be a contrast between how you study history, thoroughly or superficially. And he does this through this. This is a great, I would spend, and when we started Teachers for Africa in Namibia and we ran a school um, there, I did a week of introductory. I did a 12-week course and the first week was introductions. And I spent, I spent a good couple of days just on this statement. Because here we are, I'm in a new country, in the country of Namibia, and I am going to try. And they don't teach history in Namibia. They teach environmental sciences or something like that. Or so we teach social studies here. We don't teach history anymore. Maybe you do at Christian schools. I don't know. And so, but the idea is that we study his story. And to do that, we have to, we have to do it thoroughly. You can't just do it superficially. You've got to dig into it. You've got to, you've got to figure it out. Now, I have made a fairly thorough study of ceramics over the last 54 years that I've been making pottery. I'm pretty much an expert at this point. I can tell you a thousand different ways not to make a pot. <laughs> because I've done all of those and I know how, I know why pots crack or fall apart or whatever, or blow up in the kiln. That's exciting. You turn the kiln on, and all of a sudden you hear this, pop, 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 pop. And then in the middle of a, the whole thing, you hear, I remember firing the big wood kiln in Africa. We never figured out what made this noise. All of a sudden there's this big boom, and we went, oh, no. I don't know what it was. We never could figure it out because there wasn't shards of stuff all over. But... It was exciting. Maybe it was just an expansion of the metal holding it in that gave way or something. I don't know. But thoroughly. So, and it's a nation, as we as a nation study our history, we're going to get to know, we're going to, the more decidedly, Will it recognize, will it see and own, you know, possess an overruling providence in it we're in? We're going to see God's hand. Years ago, as we were in Zimbabwe, and we had just picked up my daughter Sarah, who had been doing her discipleship training in Gazankulu, and um, she, uh, she, um, I was, we were traveling with Johnny and Ben and Farah, and I was, we were homeschooling while we were traveling. And Sarah said to me, because she had grown up in a school where we taught this form of education called the principal approach. We call it today, we call it providential education. Because if you tell people, well, we use the principal approach, as if you tell educators, you know, we, we study the principal approach. They go, oh, we use principles too. So immediately, they think they know what you're talking about, and they don't have a clue. So the first thing you got to do with people, if you're going to teach them, is teach them that they don't know anything. This is difficult. It can take a while. And so that's why we went away from, I, I call it providential education, because people don't have a clue what you mean by that. And it just means the hand of God in education. And um, Sarah said to me, she said, Dad, let me teach the boys. I'll, teach, I'll take over history and math for you. And I said, okay. Well, I knew she could teach math because I had taught her math, and she had studied. She, she was so far ahead in math when she got to, when went back to Texas because I had jumped her two grades to Christian where he was. And, um, 
and started teaching her algebra, I think, in the seventh grade, that she had already been through calculus by the time she graduated from high school. They had to have one, they had to have a, have a special class just for her. So she was a pretty smart cookie. And she, um, she went and uh, she said, I said, well, I don't have any textbooks about Christian history of Zimbabwe or Africa. She says, oh, that's fine. She says, we got, we've got a couple of books about African history. I'm just going to look through it, and I'll, I'll figure out what God did and teach that. I thought, oh, so what did God do? How, did, how was she able to do that? How was she able to? Because she had thoroughly studied American history in high school, very thoroughly. In fact, I, I taught her. American history for two years. This is the title of my course is Evangelical and uh, Political Liberty in the Scheme of Universal History. It was a two year ninth and 10th grade history course. And uh, so we had been pretty, we had done, taken two years to do ancient and middle and then medieval and modern history thoroughly. And I had them do all sorts of T charts and other charts and analysis of events and different things that were going on. So today, we want people to know God, and we want to understand, we want to know God, and we, want, we talk about it all the time. We, gotta, you know, we, wanna, we, want, we want people to know God, like we do. Each of you has a history, has a Christian history. I used to ask people in Namibia, I said, when did Namibia's Christian history begin? begin? They'd look at me, they go, we have a Christian history? See, so in South Africa, Jan van Riebeck landed, he was the first Christian, you know, they all, oh, well, it, South Africa began in 1657 when Jan van Riebeck with the Dutch... Dutch East India Company landed and established Cape Town and da 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 da. No, South Africa, America, Namibia's Christian history starts in Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and so there it is. That's when it began, when He made it. So we start with creation, and there's a little bit in the Bible about what He did in places that He. And we can study the history of Israel. And so, as we, as we want people to know God, what are we supposed to teach them? That's really helpful. That's the curriculum. What to teach. Why teach? We teach because... We want people to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, okay? That's why we teach. How we teach, we teach through reasoning. Come, let us reason together, says in Isaiah. You know, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be right as, as white as snow. Oh, God uses, he wants to reason with us. He wants to understand um, how things work. You know those books, How Things Work? Those are great books. That's the method. How God wants us to know. How God wants us to teach. He wants us to reason with people. The scientific method is all about reasoning. And so on and so forth. I've got a lecture on how God solves problems, okay? He, uh, and so there's, there's whole, a whole book thing about how to do this, but how do we get people to know God? Well, I was at an education conference that YWAM was having in Colorado Springs one year, and when I wasn't sneaking off rock climbing at Garden of the Gods, getting my picture on the front page of the paper, which was very embarrassing since I was supposed to be at the conference. Um, you get caught when you sneak out, you know? And I just thought, really? And uh, so... We were teaching, and they'd asked me to come and teach because about starting, because they figured I must know something because I had been in Africa and I'd started a 
teacher training program, and then a school. That was the only reason. They just thought, well, we can't ignore John because he's done this, and nobody else did. So, you know, John and Suzanne. So they asked me to come and teach at the, to, the educate, to, to the Department of Education through the University of the Nations. And so <laughs> I have a lecture called The Small Letter A. And it's because I, especially with educators, I like to start at the beginning. Okay, but one of the, some of the people had, everybody brought their stuff, like a little conference, and you see the different things that people have done. And one of the things that some of our um, very, very smart and committed people had done, they'd put together this beautiful curriculum based on the character of God. 27 different character character qualities of God. I was impressed. And I'm standing up there looking at it one day, and it talks about when, when to ask the kids to stand up and when to have them sit down and when they go get their snack and all of this, and they're learning all these different, like God is good, God is faithful, God is just, God is righteous, God is all these different things. They got 27, and, they, and it was like a nine-week, I don't know, they could do it for three years. It was a, like a three-year program for preschool. And I was looking at it, thinking, this is really amazing. And a friend of mine, Bill Burtness, who was a YWAM director in Urbana, Illinois, came up, and he also had been studying with me for a number of years about providential education. And in fact, he's been teaching... I don't know if he is right now, but he's been teaching providential education, the history of America, America's Christian history, America's history, the Constitution, America's government in Kosovo, in a Muslim university, in a Muslim nation. They have him come over and he teaches about freedom. Everybody wants to be free, right? So they had him come over and he's doing this Christian course in the middle of their Muslim nation, leading people to Jesus. It's really exciting stuff. And so, see, that's what you, if you're a missionary, you get to go do stuff that's really crazy, like teaching Christian history of the Constitution in a Muslim nation without getting killed. It's harder to do that. And so he came over, and he's standing at me, and we're, we're just looking at this thing. It's this notebook, and I'm looking. I, said, I said, have you seen this? He goes, Yeah. I said, well, what do, you, what do you think about it? He goes, oh, it's amazing. And I said, oh. He says, but what's it got to do with education? I went, oh, I knew there was something wrong with it. Now, people have spent years, really good people, really smart people, spent years putting this curriculum together. but they were teaching the wrong thing, which was frightening. They were teaching the character of God. Now, if I was to... Um, here, Craig, I'll do this with Craig because he's a good guinea pig. Craig, come on up here. <laughs> You're going to like this. All right. Come on, stand up here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> See, he was making fun of me earlier, so now I'm going to get even. So, Craig, I just want you to know God is good. Are you convinced? Um, if you say so. See? If I say so. But now, I'm going to do something different. Craig, I want you to know that I love you and I really care about you, and I'm going to give this to you. I really am. <laughs> Here, we'll take the price tag off. It's free. Not free, but... Now, am I a good person to give that to you, if my motives are pure and all of that? In California, we would say you're awesome. Awesome, yeah, right. Okay, you can sit down. Take it with you. Yeah, it's yours. Okay. Now... I brought some of my pottery because that's, we want to, I want to shift from teaching the character of God 
to teaching the works of God. And let's read Psalm, well, here, let's read Romans 18, uh, Romans 1, 18 through 20. It says this, for the wrath of God, you got this up there? Whoa, look at that. Is re- <laughs> I've been wondering what's going on up there. Is, this, is it up here too? I can see what they're doing behind me. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his, listen to what's, uh, what's available to us and what God will teach us. For his invisible attributes, the things we can't see, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So when I teach history, I teach three things. I teach the word of God, the works of God, which are like his his acts through history, and the world of God, okay, the things that he made. So those three things, as we teach those things, but I think the most effective is that we learn Jesus did stuff. He healed people, right? So it's one thing, you know, to hear about it. It's another thing to see it happen, right? Any of you ever seen anybody get raised from the dead? I haven't. That would be pretty amazing, huh? Somebody's been dead for, I don't know, how many days was Lazarus dead? But it wasn't just one guy. He did, you know, and those, that's only the part that got written down. He healed people from leprosy. You know, he did stuff. He, 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 he didn't just talk about God. He actually demonstrated who God is by what he did. Now, I, I <laughs> years ago, I put a... Um, I think this was in Bible class. I put to, I give an assignment of um, about the character of God, and I have eight different characteristics, and I wanted them to put together something that a drawing or something, as we talked about these different works of God that would show that. Can you put that thing that I drew up on up here? Is it, does it show up? All right, this is my. Short little drawing. So I did it too. All right. So I couldn't remember one. So maybe somebody can help me. <coughs> but um, <coughs> there's a book called The Truth Shall Make You Free by a, a pastor named Gordon Olson. And he talks about these eight main characteristics of God. Okay. Holiness. God is holy. God is true. God is merciful, God is just. Can't remember this one. But that's that's the part you gotta find and fill out. You can email me, I'll tell you if you got it right, because I got it written down somewhere. And God is faithful. All right. So I put this together because this drawing together, people, the kids usually drew flowers and with the petals being the things, but to me this was real interactive. Okay. This is the best I could do with words, drawings. And I think it's it's to me, it really showed <coughs> how God is. So God, if you take these four things, truth, merciful, just, and the one I can't remember, those four together are God's love. So God is love. And his holiness over here, you know how it says in the Bible, be holy like I am holy? How many of you ever, they just went, really? 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 Really, God? 
Like, give me a break. What does that mean? How am I ever going to do that? So if you, people have made up really great theologies that show that, you know, we can do that. But it just didn't make any sense to me. We have imputed holiness. But I don't think that's what God's talking about. I think he's talking about real holiness. So, all right. So holiness is that is the extent to the, the extent that you follow and are uh, in all these things that you you're true and God is true. He's a hundred percent true. He's hundred percent merciful. He's hundred percent just. And behind this door, there's another one, a hundred percent whatever I left out. And all of those together make love, but the holiness is that he's doing that with 100% of his being. So people say to me, um, if, if God, why doesn't God save my uncle or my husband or my wife or my child, right? Do you think he's trying? To what extent is God trying to save that person right now? What's he doing? Like 50%? I think God's giving a hundred per- making a hundred percent effort. We don't need to pray, oh God, please save so and so. We need to pray that God, that so and so would respond to what God is doing. God's working at 100%, full blast. Now, don't, I'm not going to go into the pros and cons of this, but that's what I think. I think God's at 100% all the time. And so if you, when you're loving people, in other words, you're exercising these things, oh, I like this one, that it goes off into the vanishing point. God is faithful all the time. He's never unfaithful. He's always faithful. Okay? So this is the best I can do in teaching you about the character of God. But if I can demonstrate it by how I live, by listening to my wife when she's talking to me instead of trying to tell her what I think about it, whatever it is, see, then I can really be more... um, You know, years ago, God, I worried about selling my pottery. I actually didn't, but the thought sort of goes, what am I going to do with all these pots? And I had this sense from God that I've sort of based my career on, that if I do the best I can in the pottery I make, that it, it worked, the, and, and people like the thumb, you know, my handles, really like my handles on the cups, because I got a little thumb thing, people go, oh, that feels really good. If I, if I think about how is this piece going to be used, and design it so that it really works visually, and practically, and aesthetically, and, you know, it doesn't crack the first time you, you put it in the, you know, you pour coffee into it. I've had that happen. You're supposed to pour boiling water in all the cups you have before you sell them. That I felt like God spoke to me. He said he'd sell them for me. He'd take care of getting me selling them. I just I had to focus on doing making a product that had integrity, and he'd take care of the sales. Um, So God's interested and concerned about the work. So as we go on. If we want our children to know God, we need to do more than tell them about God's character. We need to tell them what he has done, his work. So let's look at Psalms 78. We'll get to the psalm now. I know, you wondered, right? But I'm here. That was the introduction. Yeah, you know. I learned to preach at YWAM. The introduction is 40 minutes. Then we start the sermon. That's the that's Lord in Cunningham. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. 
listen to what I've got to say. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their, our children, but tell to the ge coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet to be born, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimites, armed with the bow and arrow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his laws they forgot his works and, his, and the wonders he had shown them. So what's going to make the difference in our success? The focus as we, as Suzanne and I have moved, <laughs> it was pretty easy to feel successful in Namibia. I had the, I started this school. Look at these girls. You see these girls? These are my smile girls. One of my staff took this picture, and he won the best picture of the year award in my book. Because look at that. You just can't get any better than that. You know, Justicia and Daphne. Daphne reminded me of Phyllis Stiller. I actually knew Phyllis Stiller. Um, she lived in, you know, Hollywood. <laughs> You know, Precious and Shishmita and, oh, Shishmita and Justice, Justicia. And uh, some of these girls are still part of our program today, and they come to the lighthouse. And it was easy for me to feel successful because it was right there, boom, in front of me. I'd walk into school, everybody'd scream, Mr. Hunter, Mr. Hunter. See, now we moved back to America. Ugh. Nobody knows us here. I am not the head of anything. Except, I don't even know. I mean, you know, we co-lead the family, you know. And, uh, and I can't go and look at the things I've done. I've got to remember them. I've got to tell myself on a daily basis about what God has done in my life to be able to, you know. Faith is the, what is it, Suzanne? The substance. The substance. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence. evidence of things not seen. See, I can't see it anymore. I mean, I can, tomorrow we start school again um, in Namibia after their summer break, and but I can't be there. I can Skype or FaceTime or Zoom or whatever and say hi to my staff, but I'm not there. I can't, I can't touch them. I can't feel them, you know. I can't smell them, you know. Africa, it's got a, just something to it, and it's hard for me. It's part of my struggle, our struggle, and, but God brought us back here. I know he did. So for me, I have to remember the works of God if I expect to win this next war. God brought me back here for a reason. I'm trusting. I've always been part of a team. Now, I got a really little team right now. Suzanne's on the team. That's it. 
uh, really small team. We're, we're working with our family as part of our, we've, we've been a part of community ever since we have lived. I want to start a once a month prayer team for Community Hope. You guys are all invited. We'll figure it out. I'll, I'll tell Craig or whoever puts the bulletin up and we'll just do a couple hours once a month and we can pray for what's going on. I need, I need to be part of a team of people that care about what's important to me and to God, to this work that we have established. This is, this is a, a work of God, this thing. I want to see it keep going. We brought some sponsor cards. If you're not sponsoring a kid at Community Hope, you can join up and you can sponsor one of our kids at the high school in the, the, program, the after school program or the archery team now. So what are we supposed to do if we want to change the nation? Remember the works of God. Um, when Joshua crossed the Jordan, right, with Israel, they, uh, they stood at the edge of the river, right, and Moses wasn't there to whack it so it would open, you know, they've been, in it. but now they got the priests there with the ark on their shoulders, and they're yelling and shouting to the Canaanites on the other side, get off of there, that's our land. That's not what they did. What did they do? The priests, and the river was in flood, They actually stepped into the river, into the mud, and then it parted. And when they got across, Joshua said, hey, 12 of you, one from every tribe, go back and get one of those stones out of the middle of the river and bring it over here and build an altar. He said, because, and then then they said, why? He said, well, When your children come by and they see this thing that we did, this altar here, we can tell them about what God did. We can remind them that God is big enough to part the river. God's big enough to part the sea. And we can tell them about what God did. When Stephen, the the, uh, the deacon, was stoned, you know, and Paul's standing there holding the robes. What did he tell him? What did he, what did, as he, they give him a few minutes to, to say some, and what does he do? Go and read it. It's, it's in Acts 6 or 7 and 6. And he, he recounts the history of Israel. All the way up from the beginning to the Messiah. That's what he does. He reminds them about what God did in their nation very thoroughly. People really knew their history. See? And the heavens parted and his face shone like an angel. See? And then they killed him. But we still remember what God did. And that made an impression on Paul who wrote, Half of the New Testament, or more than half. Amazing. Let's remember the works of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your works. Thank you that you are powerful and that you're great and that you're mighty. Teach us, Lord, to thoroughly deal with our history that we will decidedly recognize and own your overruling hand. Amen.